Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Schleif, Training Coordinator with YIPA, the Youth Intervention Programs Association. I'm joined by Dr. Jennifer Clifton, the creator of Present Teacher Training and founder of Present Wellbeing LLC. Jen is a superstar in all things education, mindfulness, and educator well-being. She's led some incredible trainings for youth workers, and I'm delighted she's joining us today. Awesome. With so many things changing around us every day and the stress that uncertainty can bring, we wanted to take some time to just talk about something that's pretty important but can also feel pretty elusive, self-compassion. Mm -hmm. It's something you can always work on embodying and practicing, and it's truly a youth work superpower. It can empower you in everything you do by helping you stay balanced and true to yourself. So let's jump right into our conversation with me speaking with Jen from the perspective of a youth worker. Hey, right. Jen, I'm so awesome. glad we have a chance to talk today. <laughs> Jade, any opportunity I have to talk to you, seriously, it's a joy. It I really love it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Well, really, to get this conversation started, could you tell me what self-compassion is all about and why it matters in the youth work that I do every day? Yeah, absolutely. So self-compassion is one of those words like social and emotional learning or burnout that we've all heard, but no one really kind of knows what we mean when we talk about it because it's just such a big nebulous term. Um, and it's also one of those words or terms that we know we should be doing, but then we should all over ourselves saying like, I know I should be doing self-compassion, but I don't know what it is. And we end up actually doing like the opposite of it. It's kind of like, again, mindfulness. Like, yeah, I think I know what mindfulness is yet we live our life like being mindless. Mm -hmm. So self-compassion is one of these really super basic um, yet profound principles of way of relating. And so since, you know, as a youth worker, you're often relating to um, the youth you serve, to their parents, to the greater community. And self-compassion is a very strategic way of having a rich, kind, and I call it unconditional positive regard relationship mm -hmm. with myself to practice then relating to those in the, the work that I do, be it youth work, um, even in my own family. Like I, I always say this in anything that I teach, we're talking about your calling and your professional life, but everything we're gonna learn about self-compassion, apply it to your personal life, apply it to your family, apply it if you're a parent, if you're an aunt, an uncle, a son or daughter. Self-compassion is an interior practice of relating to the self with again, unconditional positive regard. That means no shame, no judgment. So that then we train how to be present for ourselves in a particular way where there's kindness as our base, because the way we are inward with ourselves, Jade, is the way we are outwardly with others, whether we like it or not, or say, no, 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 I can, I can beat the heck out of myself and be incredibly critical and judgmental, but I'll still be kind in my youth work. And they don't quite translate. And so self-compassion is all about that practice of relating to the self in a kind and compassionate way. And like you mentioned, for a youth worker and those of us in these healing service called professions, um, self-compassion is also a protective thing. So it is about learning how to relate to others with compassion and kindness by turning that attention on ourselves in the same way to practice it. But per compassion protects us in these human service professions from compassion fatigue and emotional burnout. So it's kind of like a, a win-win situation. Yeah, that's such a beautiful way to explain it. And I wouldn't have thought of it as something as protective, but I can definitely yep. see how it is. Um, and that's really helpful to know because a lot of youth workers like myself, we just care so much about the young people we serve. That's why we're in this work, right? We do it because we care. And so I think um, that just leads me to wondering about that compassion fatigue. If I'm already feeling that though, what does that mean? And really, what can I do about that? Right. Well, absolutely. So as a youth worker, we uh, in the in the business of well-being, we call that like the cost of caring. So to be in these highly caring professions, they are emotionally provocative. And by that, we mean they're always like kind of pulling at us to really display large amounts of empathy and compassion and kindness and understanding. And all of that is energy exertion. I mean, it, it takes energy to be compassionate and kind. And the cost of caring in this type of a profession is that while it takes a large reservoir of like that type of energy to be in relationship with somebody, the other thing is, is like often in these types of professions, like being a youth worker, there's lot, large loads of stress and stress is shown in the research to actually diminish our capacity for empathy and compassion. Because if you think, think about it, stress like makes our internal lives all chaotic and, and we feel overwhelmed and disfragmented and disjointed. 
And so it's really hard when we don't feel whole to give somebody our whole full attention, which is what self-compassion is. It's undivided attention that's directed in a very special way of seeing somebody from a place of kindness and love versus judgment, shame, and criticism. And that, that takes, that takes into, like intellectual awareness um, to direct our attention in that way. I can imagine it takes a lot of practice and a whole mindset yeah. shift, mindset shift. And it's something yeah. you have to do every single day. I mean, you Absolutely. always got to be aware of it. Absolutely. Well, and here's the beautiful thing about the practice of self-compassion, um, the, the antecedent. So the thing that comes before practicing self-compassion is actually suffering. I'll say that again, mm -hmm. in order to practice self-compassion, you actually have to suffer in order to like practice, and I know we're gonna talk about what are the steps of self-compassion, what is it? Um, you actually have to be in a moment where you are you know, doing some self-attack, where you, where you are feeling shame, where you are feeling unworthy, where you are feeling not enough. And um, in our everyday life, especially these human service professions, they're constantly throwing up experiences that, that make us feel that way. And so I often say we have lots of opportunity to practice self-compassion, sometimes four or five, six, seven, eight, nine times a day. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's absolutely true. That, those moments. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. Well, that's helpful to know. And you know, it's it sucks that we all have to suffer at some point, but <laughs> just to be fully transparent, but I, you know, that makes us all human. We're all part of that big human experience. So yep. Yeah. So I guess I do have a better handle on that emotional exhaustion that I feel in the work um, and how helpful self-compassion can be. So you were already kind of hinting at it. So the, the big core components. So really, what are those big things that I would need to know that can guide me forward how to really practice self-compassion in my daily life? Yep. Um, so first of all, as I walk into those, there's three and, and everything that I'm bringing to you, Jade, that we're talking about, especially when I start to talk about the three core facets of self-compassion, it's all by Dr. Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F. -F. And if you want to explore more about self-compassion, because she's a pioneer researcher on the art, practice, and science of self-compassion, check out selfcompassion.org. Um, so just know that that like her research is the foundation of our conversation here. But um, before we walk into her three principles, it is important to talk about that emotional exhaustion piece of like, how are you even noticing when you need to practice self-compassion? And so some really like obvious indicators of compassion fatigue, that means over caring without then restoring a sense of like um, attention on the self and self-care are things like insomnia, um, difficulty concentrating. If you're starting to feel like a lot Loss of, of pleasure in life, where you're just like, oh my God, it's just another day. You start to procrastinate. Um, another thing we do when we're feeling profound compassion fatigue or emotional exhaustion is we go into blame mode and we start to blame others. And that's just a psychological coping me mechanism to purge anger, blaming is. And so our body is always giving us, and by body, I mean physical and emotional. Our bodies are always giving us signs that we need rest and restoration and self-compassion provides us with that internal, that, that energy. Um, because when we talk about emotional exhaustion, we're talking about energetic exhaustion. We're talking about over caring without sitting our minds, bodies, and souls down and saying, you know, we'll talk about those three steps of self-compassion now saying these things to the self, which is, um, you are doing enough and anyone in your shoes would do and have felt the same way you feel. So that first step that Dr. Kristen Neff talks about, about self-compassion, Jade, is mindful self-awareness. It's the very first thing. So as we talked about signs of compassion fatigue, it's slowing our life and our mind and our bodies and our work down enough in our days to even notice when we don't feel well, to notice when, and Brene Brown calls it the warm rush of shame. Brene Brown is a, a shame researcher, right? Where you do something and then you feel ashamed or or you start to over care and you, what, what we do is we, we call it in these healing professions, like being a youth worker is we over perseverate on people's problems because we honestly care so much because caring is our superpower, but it, it gets wonky because the, we can't control the thing that we wish we could control. So if we take like a worst case youth, youth worker scenario and we perseverate in our mind about it after our work day is over, it's, we can't really control the situation, but it is stripping us of our emotional capacities. 
So the first step of self-compassion is just being aware when you're starting to either beat yourself up, um, feeling that you're not enough, feeling like you can't do enough as a youth worker, feeling like you're not making any headway in your youth work, feeling as if um, you're not giving enough of your attention and time. What would be some other things, Jade, as a youth worker, people maybe fall into that, that mental trap of like starting to really get down on the self? Just in your opinion. Yeah. What comes up to me, I think a really big one is trying to relate with the young people that you're working with, because that can go a long way in building relationships, but it's also something to be careful of, because I've experienced it where I end up relating too much. Like there are some people, young people I've worked with where their stories and experiences just resonate so much with me. Like I've experienced something similar and then that yes. triggers me. Yep. And I, at the beginning of my youth work, I really wasn't aware of why I was being triggered. So to your point, being aware of all of this stuff is really yep. the first step. So I think that's something that I've talked with other youth workers, something that they often struggle with is how close is too close? Like how, how close do I get with right. the young person? That's right. So excellent example of, of mindful self-awareness. So I, I would just recommend that, that people, you know yourself better than anyone else does. Just start to slow down your day. And when you start to feel a little off and you don't feel well, or you feel anxious, that's, a, that's the, the indicator from your body of like, stop, slow down. Something's happening in the mind that you're thinking thoughts that you're not feeling worthy or kind or mm -hmm. compassionate to yourself. And then the second step of self-compassion or core component is called common humanity. So Dr. Kristen Neff tells us, she says, you know, once you become aware of maybe how you're beating yourself up or that you're not feeling like you're doing enough is to remember you're not alone. That, that you weren't, as humans, we're not designed to be perfect. As humans, as youth workers, we're not actually here to be these heroes, right? In teaching, I work with teachers too, and we call it the hero teacher myth. When I'm educating brand new teachers, I talk about that. In our society, in our culture, there's such this myth that teachers are these saviors. And so a lot of times people come into the profession thinking that they're gonna heal people. And by that, I mean, save them. And when that doesn't happen, cause it's not realistic, even though Hollywood paints pictures that way about teachers, right? And youth workers, then we start to feel as if we've done something wrong. And so common humanity is like, I'm not alone. Um, this profession is not easy. This takes a lot of compa compassion and care. Um, when I tell people what I do as a youth worker, they probably say something like, like, what do they say to you, Jade, when you talk about what you do? They don't even, they say, well, what is youth work? Tell me yep. about it. They, they don't even know. And so then we have to, you know, talk about, talk more about that, but it, it usually goes pretty well. So. Yep. And I, yeah. I know a lot of times like people, especially in working with any youth, a lot of times people say, I don't know how you do it. Like I couldn't mm -hmm. do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I don't know how you give that much attention and that much care and compassion away. And, and what I often say is that youth workers are incredibly special people. They are, they have bigger hearts than most, which is what you put. That's what puts you actually at the risk of compassion fatigue. That's kind of like the, that's like the, the bad thing about it is that those of us who care the most are at the most risk of compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. and so why we need to practice self-compassion. Yeah. And, and you talking that, about, oh, I was just gonna say, oh, you talking about that is making me think of imposter syndrome. I just, I have a feeling that some other youth workers are struggling with that too, because I definitely did when I started of, well, yes. first of all, maybe I'm the only one kind of in the trenches struggling with this stuff. Um, but then also those thoughts of imposter syndrome creep yeah. in, like maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe someone else would be better. Maybe I shouldn't be working with these young people. And that is really real and can feel isolating. So just when you're talking yes. about common humanity, I think it's just reinforcing what you said. It's so important to remember we're not the only ones experiencing that. Correct. And that imposter, your awareness, that's step one, that mindful self-awareness of that. I, my daughters are 13 and 12. I have 12 year old daughters, twins, 12 year old daughters and a 13 year old. I feel like an imposter, imposter mom a lot of the times, because I'm like, I really don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And then I think, okay, all moms feel this way. Nobody's prepped for like middle school years. Right. And it's just like, no matter how much we know. So yes, that common humanity of I'm not alone you know, those of us in this field, you know, um, especially veteran youth workers, what would they say to the new youth workers? You know what I mean? Like, so oftentimes when I'm um, searching for um, how to practice step three, which is the self-kindness. So it goes mindful awareness. Okay. There's those imposter syndrome thoughts, common humanity. I'm not alone. Everybody who goes into this profession has to feel this way. And then that third step again, is that self-kindness. It's actually thinking a different line of thought. What I often recommend to people is this. I want you to project yourself out 20 years from now, doing the same job you're doing and put yourself in that mind and body with all of that experience. And what would she, 
or he or they say back to you about whatever moment you're stressing about? So what would your veteran self, right? So when I'm a mom and I'm like, okay, 20 years out from now, when my girls are in their thirties, that, that woman, I want, I'm going to talk to her now and have her give me some advice of what I should do right now and how I should talk to myself. And then typically that voice, when I, when I entertain that voice, that person, um, right, is, is incredibly kind, incredibly compassionate. They see where I'm at. They understand the struggle is real and they understand I'm growing in the role. And yet they're saying like, but yes, you know, you can do this. You know, you've never been smarter. You know, you've never been more experienced. You know that you are, you've never been more dedicated to something. And so that third step of that self-kindness, Dr. Kristen Neff talks about, that's the literal like restoring of those thoughts um, that are the opposite, or I often call them the mirror image of the stress. So for self-compassion, that last bit is find the mirror image thoughts that are exactly opposite from the ones that are stressing you. Because you get to choose which ones you believe. That's, That's the beautiful true. thing about well-being. Because I, you know, as you know, I do a lot about well-being. Well-being is all about integration and wholeness. And we need the two sides of the coin. We need the imposter syndrome, the pain, and the fear. And then we need the health, the happiness, and the joy, and the self-confidence. And then we get to choose which one we lean into with our attention and with our thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's integration and that's wholeness. Yeah. We, yeah. We need that capacity to feel all of those things. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And I think all I youth to... workers need some self-kindness because I know, you know, you could plan everything. You have all these activities planned out. And if those plans fall apart, you know, yep. it's easy to judge yourself and say, well, maybe I'm not cut out for youth work, but that's right. No, thinking on your feet and being flexible and yes. being kind to yourself is such a huge part of it too. So such a and good what reminder. I've discovered with my own children, um, as I've worked with teachers, teacher educators, anybody who's again, in these healing human service professions, the people that you're serving just want your full presence. They just want your attention, your whole attention. And so really there's nothing you can't do wrong if you come at come to your work and to them with a, a happy, healed heart some, where you feel good and you just say, you know, I'm not exactly sure how this is all going to go, but I'm fully here for it. Mm -hmm. And I know we can work together at it. And that's really what people crave. That's really what youth crave. Um, Cause then that allows them to feel seen and known in your presence when you're just, you're fully there for them. So I often say self-compassion is like that, that private, like psychological housekeeping I do with myself before I go out and do my work um, with anybody that I feel called to like work with. It's, it's my own private thing. And then what it does is it allows me to feel better. And, and I deserve to feel good in a profession where I'm giving to others. I just do. Absolutely. All youth workers do as well. Yeah. Your profession was not, did not call you to deplete you. Your profession called you to heal and help other people while you felt good in and of yourself. And self-compassion gives us an incredible tool to do both those things. I love that. And that is a natural transition to the last thing I wanted to ask you about. You're talking about working with other people. Um, yeah. So I definitely see the benefit for ourselves. Um, do you have any advice on teaching self-compassion and modeling it for the young people that we're working with? Absolutely. So once you first, the first and foremost thing you have to do is you have to practice it for yourself because we can never give to others what we first don't give to ourselves. And same with educators or teachers or parents or youth workers where we're wanting to model social and emotional well-being and self-compassion is a form of social and emotional well-being is we first have to live it and breathe it. And so keep practicing again, that mindful awareness, you are not alone. And then again, talking to that veteran self and restoring the thoughts. So they're a lot kinder because then what you'll start to see are those youth when they need self-compassion the most, you'll start to notice some patterns in their thought processes or in their talking and in the way that they're acting and behaving. And then you won't say, okay, let's sit down and do the three steps of self-compassion. You won't say that, but what you could, but you may not. And what, what I do with my own three daughters is I just say, oh, so what I notice you saying is this, and, and it seems like, uh, how are you feeling about that? And so I just kind of walk them through the process so that they can start to pay attention, that mindful awareness. What am I thinking right now? Am I being negative? Am I seeing it from a very you know, narrow point of view? What's another way we could see it? So what I do is I use those three steps of self-compassion in a particular context. And I just use questions to, pro to pose to 
the youth I work with so that they do the work. It isn't my job as a youth worker to do the work of somebody else's self-compassion, but I can hold the space and I can pose the questions because I know the work because I've done it. So that's, mm. that's some of the best way to do it and to trust yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that too. I think there's a big difference between walking alongside young people and helping them figure it out as yeah. opposed to just trying to give them all the answers. I think yeah. that's really powerful, totally. helping them figure it out what it means for themselves. Yep. And just say like, what's another way to look at this? Like I can tell how you're, by the way you're behaving and the emotions I'm noticing, none of them are bad, by the way. I mean, well, sometimes but some behaviors can be problematic because they can actually be, um, I don't know, they can be dangerous, I suppose, depending on the situation. But if you're in a safe space with the youth that you're working with, um, you can just name that for them. Because remember, when we get super stressed, all of our attention goes back to that reptilian part of the brain. And we quite literally can't think and hear straight. And so when we're working with youth, it is about us slowing our breath and body down and helping them to come back to baseline and then just engaging them and by us being curious with them to help them then dive into themselves and then be curious about, well, what were they thinking about their capacity? What's another way to look at it? And you could even see if it works to run the whole, like, I don't know, like add 20 years to your life. How old are you going to be? Oh my gosh, you're going to be 33. Can you even imagine that? And then that kind of gets them out of their mind, right? Okay. What would that 33 year old say to you right now? I don't know. It's just, it, 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 it just allows people to just get that big perspective, which is also a part of health and well-being. Because whenever we're in um, attack mode of ourselves and stressed, we feel super small and things feel really impossible. And so whenever we can break through and get a much bigger perspective and step way back, we feel more free. And all of a sudden then energy and love and kindness and compassion rush into those spaces. Um, and we call those psychic rewards. It's like in those moments where we're connecting with a youth that we're serving, we're not telling them what to do and we're not giving them the answers, but there's this really beautiful connection happening, you know, um, and that that's serving them and it's serving you as the youth worker as well. See, I wish I had a youth worker around when I was younger to say, think of yourself 20 years from I know. now. That would have been such a good activity. <laughs> Very powerful. I'm thinking of myself 20 years from now. I'm only... 37. I'm kidding. <laughs> Love it. I don't want to go back. I don't know about you. I don't want to go back. Hey, okay, maybe some to, parts of it. You need to stop me now. Now I'm getting really off track. Well, I was going to, yeah, I, I, you are a fountain of insight and knowledge and nuggets of wisdom. And I know we could talk about self-compassion all day long, but I just yeah. want to thank you for walking us through the basics of the superpower yeah. of self-compassion and how, and how helpful it can be for ourselves and the work we do. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for suggesting we do this. It was lots of fun. Thanks, Jane. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, many thanks to Jen and thank you for learning along with us. Our hope is that this conversation will help you protect yourself from compassion fatigue to be the best youth worker you can be. And modeling self-compassion for the young people you serve will no doubt help them on their journeys of self-care and well-being too. We truly can't thank you enough for the work you do, for the good you create in the world, and for the difference you're making for all our young people every single day. Now get out there and keep building your self-compassion muscles. Thank you all so much.